Okay, hi everyone, I'm Renee from ECB. Thank you very much for attending. I'm just uh, showing the video at the moment so I can say hello and you guys can see me. I'm gonna shut it down so uh, we can have uh, uh, the, broad, the broadest band available so I can run some uh, video clips that we have in the, in the presentation. So thank you very much for attending. And uh, we gotta start right now. Okay, so uh, today, uh, just a little bit of synopsis. We're gonna uh, talk about the revegetating uh, difficult soils. Uh, we will be diving into this topic, and this will be a different way on how we revegetate soils. The presentation will go over how using a biotic soil amendment can increase the vegetation success on our sites when used as a topsoil replacement or when used in conjunction with less than ideal soils. We'll look into a multitude of factors that also come into play in creating successful soils and vegetation densities. And we then we're gonna look into four to five projects uh, real life examples on different conditions where the biotic amendment uh, achieved uh, uh, success. So uh, it is a challenge that uh, we have as an industry and also from the designing point of view, uh, either if we are in oil and gas, if we are in mining or municipal, landscaping, commercial, residential, we are all going to face issues with reclamation, restoration, revegetation before we can close out our project. Well, of course, we are uh, working and we're specifying uh, living organisms as seeds. And uh, it's not only about germination, it's not just germination that's important to close out the project and terminate the contract. We are looking for more than just short-term vegetation to close out our projects. So we need long-term sustainable vegetation in order to be successful. So the truth is that uh, we can grow grass almost on anything, but in the short term, of course, uh, vegetation needs to be viable for its own continuity, right? But it isn't going to survive in the long term in such tough conditions year after years. And we have very tough conditions on our sites, very uh, secluded sites, dry sites, uh, without any watering available. So we have to make sure that we set up our, our vegetation to success. So what we are really looking for is self-sustaining vegetation, season after season, year after year. We do not want our job sites to become pets, uh, highly dependent on our food, or let's say fertilizer and water. We want to install them to perpetuate and take care of themselves, dive into their own life cycle, and uh, we don't want to go on and, and have any future fixes. Fixes are very expensive, as we know. So we're looking forward into no refeeding and no reseeding because that will cost us a lot of money. Here in this slide, uh, it is a very important one because uh, successful vegetation plays an important role in all our erosion control measures. This is a vital component of our vegetation and erosion control plans. For example, uh, the permissible shear stress on our strongest mat, the P42 TRM, is 14 pounds per square foot while vegetated, but unvegetated, it's only 3.3. So that holds true to all types of erode erosion control products. We can have an erosion control system, even a mulch or a TRM or a biodegradable blanket, but if it's not vegetated, it will not be successful. We need vegetation to maintain the erosion control. At the end of the day, vegetation is the ultimate erosion control that 
nature has figured out in millions of years. So we have to start paying more attention to long-term vegetation to maintain our erosion control in our projects. Our current practices uh, look like this. Uh, so when it comes to soil, uh, this looks like our usual technique, right? We strip the topsoil and pile it up, which the topsoil people tell us not to. Uh, do you know why? Uh, what they tell us is that if we pile up the, the soil uh, above uh, three feet or a meter or so, uh, we start damaging the soil structure. And uh, the higher you go, uh, the bigger the damage you have to the structure and you start developing an aerobic environment, which can be detrimental to all the soil microbes that we have in the, in the soil. Let's call it soil by now. So that tall pile of soil that's going to sit on the corner of your job site for a year, maybe year and a half, it's basically cooking itself out. Once the project is wrapped, we spread that depleted soil back out, if we can call it soil at the moment. We compact it, apply our erosion control, uh, we seed it, we fertilize the, the surface, then on top we, we apply the erosion control system. We sometimes water it. And how is that working for us? Well, uh, we, as an industry, we're not being uh, quite successful. It's, uh, it's quite a challenge to be able to revegetate uh, our, our sites. And uh, we really have to look into things uh, differently. We are not achieving successful vegetation our, on our sites, and that, that's a fact. And we all know this guy. And if we want to have different results, well, we have to do things differently. And yet, even with all the failings from our uh, usual technique, we keep on doing the same thing time and again. And as I said, if we want different results, we have to do things in a different approach. Therefore, we can think of different results. First things first. I started talking about soil, but the first step is stop treating soil like dirt. That soil is dirt. And that soil without the living microorganisms that are beneficial for our vegetation efforts. We need to pay attention to the soil. It's the support system we give to our plants. And plants need to shelter through season after season and give them the soil that they need in order to be successful. So we really need to set them up for success. And the truth is that uh, most of the topsoil available does not have the organic matter and the biological components that we will see next. This is an example of a topsoil specification. And of course, currently our vegetation uh, plants are heavy in topsoil. We might might be uh, specifying uh, topsoil and and uh, try to determine what is topsoil or what is uh, an important, a good quality topsoil. And look, it isn't that we are not trying to be successful. We know soil is an important part of a successful vegetation. But there are some issues with these attempts, one of which uh, uh, I try to illustrate here in these specifications. Uh, on the, this is the Alberta, uh, British Columbia, sorry, uh, the Ministry of Transportation specification for three types of topsoil. We have the on-site topsoil, imported topsoil. It can be mixed and somehow manufactured to improve it. And... At the bottom, we have the manufacturer uh, topsoil. And uh, they do mention something about, as you can see, that uh, the mixture has to have chemical and physical properties to sustain uh, vegetation. Uh, they talk about uh, percentages of uh, sandy soil versus uh, 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 organic, also mention of a little bit of a 15% organic matter in dry weight basis. But uh, usually, a very good uh, topsoil would be around 35 to 5% organic matter. But when topsoil is, specif is specified, what are we really paying for? Many times, the specification has no truly measurable elements of the quality of the topsoil regarding 
the biotic uh, life in it. And uh, a little bit of the organic matter is mentioned. But really, at the end of the day, we're paying a premium for that brownish dirt that is also common. For example, how, how much are we hauling in uh, or, or we might uh, be specifying uh, on, our, our, on, our, uh, on our projects? Uh, we can see here that the hauling in uh, uh, truckloads to spread out uh, around three inches in a hectare would be around 70 to 100 truckloads per hectare. And more even if we want to, if we specify six inches, and that's a lot of money that we're hauling in. And uh, topsoil sometimes is hard to get, and we have to work with whatever we have available on site because it could be prohibited to haul in really, really expensive topsoil. So we really have to pay attention on this. And uh, this is a, an example of uh, a weighted unit, unit pricing from uh, Alberta Transportation, some of uh, 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 British Columbia. Uh, around Canada, prices might be fair uh, ge depending on geographical location. Uh, let's say if it's a, a mine that is hard to get to and you have to travel 200 kilometers, 300 kilometers to get topsoil, prices will rock, skyrocket. But uh, in this example, what I want to show is uh, uh, topsoil prices might be around the $32, $33 per cubic meter. And for a hectare, you can go uh, easily up to $35,000 per hectare or fifty over $50,000 per hectare. And that's a lot of money. So we're talking about topsoil. What's, what is topsoil? I think you'd be shocked to find that the part that gives us uh, any FN benefit at all in topsoil is just that 5%. And that 5% is not even in all soils. It's part of a soil that uh, is alive and biological, uh, where biological activity happens and what plants depend on. Uh, this is the O horizon, and that's where a nutrient and the water holding capacity happens, and the life happens, and the nutrient cycle is established for the long-run vegetation success. And uh, also, we have to take a look into this, that uh, when we're hauling in a lot, the big, uh, a lot of truckloads, we're bringing in 45% of inert material. And uh, half of it is uh, open pore space that is really necessary to have a, a oxygen exchange and water uh, passing through the pores in the soil so that the roots can develop. But uh, that 5% of organic matter, there's another thing that we have to think about. Is, is that organic matter giving us the benefit here? Well, uh, we have to look into that. Uh, here is a... And a lab test for uh, for some uh, soil uh, test that I, that I did uh, this year, and here we can see that we are not getting the topsoil benefits. Unfortunately, uh, topsoil is not that good, and at all that expense for sometimes less than the ideal material. The fact is that uh, we don't get enough quality topsoil to go around. So sometimes, as I said, we manage what's best available. In this example, we can see that we only have a the, the best scenario of the of the uh, report is 0.7 organic matter, and this is a real world example. Excuse me, and this just ain't gonna cut it. This will not work. This and we will have a hard time working with this type of soil. And uh, now that the, the conventional approach uh, holds in a, lo a lot of uh, uh, product on site. Uh, we're spending a lot of time and money getting the parts we don't necessarily need. We're hauling in inert material and open pore space. And what we really need is that 5% of topsoil where the organic matter and is and where we happen to get the benefit from. So ideally, we just want, we just need to bring that 5%. That's uh, in this uh, 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 graphic, it's just half a truckload, right? And this is uh, the amount of, uh, of uh, the biotic earth, uh, biotic soil amendment that we need per hectare. That's uh, 3,900 kilos per hectare. And uh, that's just four pallets of product. 
compare that to all the truckloads that you wanna that you should, would be hauling into the project. So I know that you guys uh, might be uh, starting to think uh, here. Okay, Renee is talking about uh, uh, topsoil substitute. All right, okay, but if it's not topsoil, what are our options? What do we have? Well, the first thing that might come into mind probably is the the a very common source of organic matter, and that is uh, compost, which is very difficult to remove the amount of undesirable uh, material out of it. And uh, this is a composting facility in the U.S., in Las Vegas. And uh, these guys put a lot of effort uh, trying to, to get the best compost available. And the same happens in Canada, I'm pretty sure. Uh, composting facilities uh, do a lot of effort, and there are a couple of problems, though. Sorry for that. Thought I had a question. Uh, we can leave the questions uh, till the end, so we can have a, a flow. I'm gonna look uh, into the uh, questions box you guys have there. And okay, continuing with the slide. Uh, I was mentioning compost, uh, we could have a, a, a couple of problems there. There are lar large facilities where they move huge volumes in and out, and the capacity to test this batch is, is not there. So, uh, for example, composting does not remove heavy metals, chemicals, salts, herbicides, fungicides, any kind of pesticides, even pathogens. And if it's not correctly treated, uh, we can get it in our uh, end product uh, compost. Also, uh, we want to be thinking about runoff concern where installation is next to a river or an ecologically sensitive area such as streams or any kind of a sensitive site. So depending on the contaminant, even non-environmentally sensitive sites should be of concern. Of course, if you can get uh, good quality topsoil and the numbers work fine, or you can get compost in a very good quality and it's a uh, good pricing. Why not use it? But uh, let's be, uh, let's think about it. That's uh, usually hard to get to get to you. Uh, sorry, I get a message here that uh, are you guys uh, hearing me? Ali, I got a message that uh, you couldn't hear me. Are you hearing me now? I can hear you. Oh, okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, sorry for that, guys. Uh, so there is another concern with compost, and that's weed contamination. That that's a big fear. Uh, more of uh, if we're working with native seeds. Uh, we have to be very careful with this. It's really hard to get rid of seeds, uh, weed seeds in compost, and this is something we all hate. But really, uh, weed seeds can easily pass through the composting process. If the ideal temperature is not maintained, we get what we have in the, in the picture. Guess what, uh, what was specified? That was, those were the blue bonnets, but in the compost we, have, uh, we had that bastard cabbage, and there goes all, all of our maintenance budget to try and get rid of the weeds. And this will give us a, a, a lot of uh, problems if we're trying to close out our project. And uh, uh, weed seeds also, you have to think about that some weed seeds do not germinate in a week time, in two weeks. Some, some weed seeds might go dormant, dormant and may pop up uh, in a couple of months time. So we could have a, 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 a hidden problem there also so the biotic approach asks us uh, if we really need to uh, import topsoil or compost for establishing uh, vegetation and uh, here was uh, i'm going to start uh, addressing uh, a lot of, uh, of the biotic uh, uh, amendment the biotic birdie or biotic earth but first of all have you ever wondered why greenhouses use a lot of peat moss uh, well, peat moss uh, has a lot of advantages regarding uh, benefits. It brings lots of benefits regarding uh, for our vegetation efforts. So these are uh, four basic ones. Uh, if you're not going to use compost, the other source of organic matter to consider is peat moss. 
uh, it has a low carbon to nitrogen uh, ratio. This means uh, how much uh, nitrogen is pulled away by bacteria from the plants in order to decompose uh, organic matter. So uh, peat moss has a very low ratio, 26, 27 to 1, in comparison to wood chips that you might use in your gardens for compost, on a rose garden, for example, that might go over to 500 to 1. That means and a high ratio that the bacteria will end up using nitrogen as a fuel in order to decompose uh, that the wood. Also, you might find in wood-based processed uh, 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 biotic amendments that the carbon to nitrogen ratio might go over to 100 or so. Another benefit is uh, the cation exchange capacity. Well, that's incredibly high in peat moss. It's really astronomical. And that's the soil ability to hold on to nutrients to make them available to our plants. So uh, peat moss has a very high uh, uh, CEC. That's beneficial. We really want to have a reserve of nutrients on site for our, our vegetation. Another benefit that it brings on site is uh, water holding capacity, which is truly remarkable. It's a, it's a remarkable ability. Uh, and it makes perfect sense when you realize uh, well, how peat mugs expand in nature and they hold up a lot of moisture. We do really want to have that on our sites so uh, we can aid our, our vegetation. And uh, the last one is that the peat moss is very long lasting because of its unique honeycomb cellular structure. So it will last a long time in our soil and we will not need to go over and renew it annually as we do in our gardens every year. We put some compost on our plants uh, for it to have a, a organic matter available. And I want to address another thing, uh, some misconceptions about peat moss. And uh, I bring this up because uh, we have environmental concerns regarding our design. We want to specify something that is environmentally friendly. And uh, North American peat moss, and the one that we use, which is harvested in, in, in northern Manitoba, is sustainably harvested. The misconception comes from several years ago when there used to be a block harvesting practice. And what they did is just they, they just took big chunks of uh, peat moss out of the bogs and left a big hole. And the uh, uh, peat moss wouldn't uh, regenerate as well as it should. What it's done uh, nowadays is to vacuum harvest. They temporarily drain the bog, harvest about a meter and a, mirror, a meter and a half of, uh, of peat moss, take it out, and then flood the, the bog right uh, again so uh, they, they can uh, regenerate themselves. And this is why biotic amendments are really important. Remember that I mentioned, and re, uh, remember that uh, soil analysis will look 0.7% uh, of uh, organic matter? Well, yeah, but it doesn't matter if the organic matter doesn't have microbial life in it. Organic matter is as good as the micro microbial life that inhabits it. So what we are seeking with the biotic amendment is to inoculate the soil with microbial life so that it generates organic matter. I want to repeat this because there is a huge difference in throwing out organic matter and inoculating the soil to regenerate on organic matter. We want the microorganisms to start building the soil on site. And these microorganisms and this cycle is what establishes the so-called nutrient cycle. So in biotic earth, we have a uh, this but nitrogen fixing bacteria and how is this beneficial in soils and the nutrient cycle well this is the vital component that absolutely plays an important role and this is where soil life starts this is what makes uh food nitrogen available to plants and makes them green and usually this is the first one to die out in that stockpile soil in our site that turn that by the end of the year, it's just dirt. It's just a mineral dirt. So those nitrogen fixing bacteria are the first to degrade on those stock piles, and they are very important to have them in the soil for them to fixate nitrogen from the atmosphere to the ground. 
also we have uh, 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 shredding bacteria. And uh, we start to see the benefits of uh, microorganisms uh, when they start shredding the organic matter and make nutrients available and usable by the plants. These bacteria help to get the nitrogen, phosphate, phosphates, and potassium available, the NPK and micronutrients, they make them available for the plants to feed on them. And of course, there is a huge variety of microorganisms in soils. There's not just these two, uh, these ones I'm showing you guys, there are millions of types of uh, microorganisms that science hasn't even discovered yet. But there is another component we have learned a lot about in the last decade, and that's uh, mycorrhiza. How is this beneficial in, the, in, in our natural soils for, for setting up a food cycle? Well, mycorrhiza is a symbiotic organism that when working with plant, both get uh, beneficial benefits. Uh, symbiotic relationships with microbes allow plants to fend off pathogens and disease. Uh, mycorrhiza, as you can see in the picture, you can see that orange uh, central root and all the white mesh around it, that's the mycorrhiza, uh, dramatically incre increasing the root system area. And what it does, it improves water uptake and nutrient uptake and it could also uh, be more, it makes the root system more efficient. And without a healthy soil, you are condemned to be applying fixes and refertilizing them. So we really would like to have these little guys helping us underground and feeding our, uh, our plants. Also, ecologically, mycorrhiza has a great impact in storing around 30% of the soil carbon in our in, in in the ground, and this is an example. Uh, this is a root mass comparison of grasses, and they no brainer here. Which one has the better long term survival opportunity? Well, of course, the one that that has been inoculated with, with the mycorrhizal fungi. So, what is really happening underground? This is uh, it's really simplified, and this is where the magic happens when uh, biotic uh, soil amendment is specified and used in the field. You look at the, at the soil, there are many nutrients available, but not usable for the plant. And what mycorrhiza fungi does, it transport, it unlocks the nutrients, transports them to the root zone, feeds the plant, and of course, this is a business kind of thing, the plant exudates carbohydrates, which uh, fungi cannot synthesize, and the uh, fungi gets these sugars and feeds from them. So that's what happens, really. Mycorrhiza unlocks the nutrients and are also transporter of the nutrients and, of course, water. And uh, mycorrhiza gives nutrients to the plant, and the plant gives sugars to the, to the, back to the fungi. And that's how, how it works. That's a very, very simplified way. But that's business as usual underground. So how is this beneficial? Well, this is a vital relationship where, that we, we want to have on our sites because plants fed with mycorrhizal fungi grow larger, more vigorously. They, they develop healthier and deeper roots, uh, also stems and leaves. And therefore, we have a, a higher density of vegetation, also blocking out any weeds that might be uh, in the seed bank underneath the soil. Also, my, very importantly, mycorrhiza ends in perpetuating the food cycle in soil, helps build up the soil and maintain the tools that plant needs to survive in the long term. So uh, also, they help repair uh, the soil food web and degraded soil. So th this, think about these guys as nutrient magnets. And here in the picture, we can see the mycorrhizal uh, hypha. Uh, that go further in the soil so that the root uh, can reach up further down. And uh, just take into account that around 85, 90% of the plants in this planet has a relationship with mycorrhiza, and this has been happening for millions of years. So this is something that Mother Nature has already uh, figured out. So why not put Mother Nature in a bag, sort of speaking? This is our product, Verdio Biotic Earth. It's an organic product. It's 60% sphagnum peat moss, 40% straw with flexible flax fiber. Oh, well, there's a, a little percentage of mycorrhiza bacteria, some growth stimulants, 
and micronutrients. But the, the important thing here is that uh, if we want to create a sustainable habitat for our vegetation, there are five basic necessities that plants need. And that's temperature, the right one for germination and for growth. That's water to get all the metabolic processes working in the soil and in the plant. Sunlight for photosynthesis. Air, sufficient air spaces, that's the fourth, fourth one. That's air, air spaces in the soil. And food and nutrients. The first four, we cannot control. We cannot help with that. But with the fifth one, food and nutrients, we can help a lot with that, uh, adding a biotic soil amendment. And uh, I would like to mention that biotic earth is not a fertilizer. You still need to do soil analysis and apply some fertilizer. Just think about three different feeding stages for plants. The first one being the seed, that little, little uh, native seed, uh, even maybe smaller than a mustard seed. Uh, it has a little packet of energy for germination and for the root to pop out and reach out to the ground. And then the second step, the second feeding step, is the nutrient. Are the nutrients in the ground? If we don't have them, we add fertilizer, right? But what happens when the fertilizer? Uh, we run out of fertilizer and we don't have any more food in the in the in the in soil. Well, that's where the the, the biotic amendment helps out to uh, perpetuate that food cycling process that we really need on site. And another thing that I like to mention is that uh, soil biotic soil amendments, by definition, are not erosion control in itself. It is an amendment that aids in erosion control. We will look further in, in, in the following upcoming uh, uh, slides about that. But this is what we are trying to set. This uh, putting all together is a biomimicry of the O horizon and setting the food nutrient cycling. So this is uh, how, how it works. Uh, we have a healthy plant community, plants die up, the organic matter decomposes, there comes the shredding bacteria, making nutrients available to the plants. And then mycorrhiza helps to transport and unlock those nutrients and uh, make them available for the plant. So, this is a, the, the, a very good combination to have the biotic combines with the soil minerals, pore space, and growing roots further, further down into the soil. So now I would like to uh, follow on with uh, real life examples. But first of all, where should we be using, or where is, is it recommended to use biotic soil amendment where, well, we have minimal to no organic, just like in the picture. Uh, where there's little to no soil structure or it's been degraded, uh, where, we, where we want to increase uh, water storage, and where we have lifeless organic matter. We could have organic matter, but with no biotics in it, so it isn't helping us at all. We come back to this slide, this slide sorry, uh, where we're not getting top soil benefits, but how does that look in real life? Well, it looks like this. A highly erodible soil, and uh, yeah, I, I want to uh, tell you uh, guys that uh, uh, biotic uh, earth is not, it doesn't just work in the south of, or, or the west or arctic condition or wet one. Wet ones it works. Uh, we've been using it uh, from Alaska down to Peru uh, through arid climates, uh, even for uh, winter seeding, dormant seeding. But regardless of where we are in planet Earth, soil improvement is the same. Doesn't matter of the geographical condition or climatic conditions. This is our, our uh, oldest study case. It's the oldest study case uh, for a biotic soil amendment. This is in Milner Ridge uh, up north in Manitoba. It was finished uh, around 12 years ago. So we had this really bad uh, uh, sand and soil structure, uh, which is basically dirt. And uh, biotic earth was specified due to the, the high cost of hauling in uh, topsoil. And the owner saved around $270,000 in this project while using the biotic amendment as a topsoil substitute. So notice back there, that the blanket crew is right behind the hydro seeder, and biotic earth will still require an erosion control. 
on top of it. And in this case, we, we uh, straw blanket would use. And you can actually see, see it being kicked out right behind the hydro city. That means that uh, it doesn't need any curating time. You can work fast with it and you don't have to wait a couple of days to be for it to be curated. One very important uh, thing here is that it is one flat application rate regardless of the slope and regardless of the organic matter that might be present in the uh, on site. Uh, think about it as uh, uh, the vaccine. You could take a, a flu vaccine, we just need a, a, a small amount. Why should we increase the, the inoculation rate when we have uh, steeper slopes? We shouldn't, right? Uh, so this is something uh, really uh, easy to work with, really easy to uh, control and to look after on the site, and very easy to specify. It's pretty straight, straightforward. This is short-term success I want to uh, show you guys. And uh, again, you can see the erosion control uh, blanket, the straw blanket, and the vegetation growing through. We always need the vegetation growing with the erosion control uh, system. This is 13 uh, weeks later. Uh, I call it short-term success still. There is something you guys don't see in the slide, and those are weeds. You might see one over there, but hey, we're in the outdoors. We have animal droppings and, and, and it's found to happen. But the trick here is to get the vegetation grow fastly and close out any competing weeds. So we have no weeds here. And long-term success, after four stations, uh, we got the uh, successful uh, revegetation. Uh, the desired vegetation was able to fully colonize the site, leaving very little room, again, for the weeds to get a root hold on our site. So this, being this the oldest uh, uh, going uh, study case, uh, we wanted to go back. That was uh, seven years later after the application and check out if the product was doing what it's supposed to do. And uh, Still now, 12 years later, it's going strong. And we can see this uh, uh, analysis, soil analysis. It was a DNA uh, analysis. And we got, uh, after the application, including the biotic earth applied in the soil, uh, the bacteria count came 11 fold and uh, fungi and mold, which is basically both of them are fungi. Uh, it came the 25 to seven uh, fold for the mold. So what we have here, is an established nutrient cycling in the soil, and uh, that is what perpetuates our vegetation. So this is a healthy life sustained along 12 years, and it's still vegetated and going strong. This case, uh, what I want to show here is that organic matter alone is not the solution. This is another interesting project. This is uh, in San Antonio River Authority in Texas. These are areas where there were agricultural fields for the missions over 300 years ago in San Antonio. And in this exact plot was where there were melon fields and for these missions and they grew all the food and agriculture was going on. So it was bound to have a lot of organic matter. The interesting thing with this project that on paper, the soil looked ideal. It had 5.3 organic matter and yet they still had problems for the vegetation to grow on this site. So uh, they decided to try out uh, uh, biotic earth and only weeds that were adapted to those extreme conditions uh, grew somewhere around, but uh, they really needed some vegetation to grow there. And biotic earth, as you can see, there's a, the, the comparison at the, at the left. Uh, where it was uh, applied, and at the right, we have uh, the bottom left corner of that picture. You can see some weeds. That's where the biotic amendment was not applied. Everything else stayed the same. Same fertilizer, same seeds. And you can see at the top of the, of the right picture that we have a lush uh, vegetation. And that's a practical example that shows us that biotic, uh, sorry, that the organic matter is not the, the, the solution. We need the biotics. This is an example of a short-term growth on shale rock. I wanna see if this hopefully runs 
smoothly because uh, take a look at the pink lady's finger. You can see on the on the soil in here as we, as we dig in under the vegetation, it's just pile after pile of shale rock. There's no real topsoil in there, and it's vegetated that well in less than a month. You can see some uh, clover over there, some, some legumes to fix uh, nitrogen that were specified. But uh, now you can see a long-term growth next year. Take a look and compare the soil building that has happened on the shale rock. Out here in our project site out in Pittsburgh, I showed you guys last year, had biotic earth applied directly over a bunch of shale rock. I just wanted to show you the next year's successive season, no reseeding. It is still coming back this thickly. If you look down at the soil surface, what this is vegetated on top of is just shale rock after shale rock. Very little topsoil or fines to speak of. But there's more this year than there was last year as that natural topsoil forming process starts and keeps forming thanks to the biotic earth. Although it is recommended, uh, there was no uh, soil preparation in this in this project. And you could look at the at the at the soil on, the, on her fingers, and that's the natural topsoil process forming process that I'm talking about. That's what, what we really want to have on site. This is another project, Dillingham, Alaska. Incredibly remote project, bringing topsoil was insanely costly. This was the Dillingham uh, runway, and it allowed for, for a greater safety and access for larger planes to, to go there, because it, it was, uh, that was the, at the time, the world's largest sockeye salmon uh, production and they needed to to export their product and uh, this project involved hauling in one million tons of fill material and chosen for its superior qualities for building a runway the material was some of the worst at growing vegetation it was great for the runway but really bad for vegetation and it had uh, only 1.1 organics that was the soil test uh, that we got back and uh, this is a really tough soil, so what's good for one, it turns out that it's not good for the other, right? And here we can see uh, they did some uh, uh, topography, some grading, some surface modifying, and this is a good pra practice to have the, the pockets to help retain humidity. And uh, for the project, to file a notice of termination, it required a minimum of 70% uh, vegetation establishing, establishment. And with that low organic, uh, that was a big challenge. Uh, the engineering firm and the, the Department of Trans Transportation consulted and agreed to use uh, burial biotic earth on the project. And uh, you can see how they are spreading it out in the picture and in the next one, uh, you can see uh, that uh, the grass is already growing. They stopped for about uh, two weeks, but uh, the, the seeds have already uh, germinating. And uh, here they used uh, fertilizer of, of course, the specified seed and the biotic earth applied in one step application. The first hydro seeding uh, tank fill up was that mix. And on top of it, uh, the think of a two-step process, what is suggested, suggested is to put an erosion control product. This was a bonded fiber uh, matrix that was used. Uh, this was a pro matrix, and uh, it was applied uh, on top of it on the same day. So uh, initial results were quite favorable within a much shorter than expected timeline. They closed out ahead of schedule. Uh, we did not, there no receding necessary and no refertilizing. So here we have a, a, an example of a short-term and long-term success. And uh, this was a, a, a great success really because uh, they have a cost savings around 20%. That's what they told us. 
and uh, that's something that we really want to show on, on on our specifications and the benefits this is uh they set uh green wall this is in ontario uh these gabions were just filled with uh with rocks and on the left side we have a protected wetland and on top of the gabions is a, a highway and uh, of course a lot of uh, uh, trucks going in cars going driving by uh they wanted to vegetate the gabions with uh, minimal amounts of almost no soil so that the vegetation could trap any contaminants coming from the road, such as oil, the grease, and any spills, and to protect the wetland at the left. So this is where biotic earth was specified and applied, and uh, whatever grew there, that's what they wanted. If, the, if weeds grew, it didn't matter. But uh, we found out of another uh, hidden benefit we didn't know. <laughs> And that was that the maintenance crew was really happy that they didn't have to come back and, and wash all the graffiti and stuff that the kids painted on, on the gavians. Uh, these were gavians with root wrap, biotic earth, and flex terra used. This is a quick example of a minimal amount of topsoil. You can see it's basically rocks over there. This is in Manitoba. Uh, we have some germination happening in. Uh, two weeks time. And this is a one year, uh, I'm sorry, six year later success. Take a look at the soil. Cedar Road about six years later, look at the thick vegetation that we've got here. And we look in under the soil and see what we have. It's basically just rock, 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 and more rock. And we're able to grow this vegetation on. Uh, utilizing biotic earth. So, as you can see, you saw in this picture, uh, biotic earth is, is was designed to be uh, applied with a hydro seeder. Of course, you can broadcast it, but you will end up using about four or five times what you really need per per hectare. But uh, in very difficult to get areas, you can do that manually, and it works just the same. So we engineers, we do like uh, new stuff, uh, but success or failure depends on vegetation, not my, no matter what you use. So uh, you can see here that they all need to vegetate in order to succeed, and biotic earth works with any type of, uh, of uh, erosion control uh, system out there in the market. Uh, here is an example with Fleximat. Uh, I think this was applied on top of the mat at the moment. And uh, this shows that uh, we can use any type of erosion control product. And this is was done on purpose, of course. And uh, this is, it shows where biotic earth was not used, where the, the soil lacked uh, biotics to grow vegetation efficiently. And uh, that's a striking difference. And sometimes it's a common thing to see after we just use topsoil or, or any dirt spread out on our at the end of our project. So uh, this is my presentation. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, we can answer. We have around uh, 13 minutes uh, available. Uh, if you have any any uh, uh, projects that uh, you need any assistance or we can look into uh, any design properties or any assistance whatsoever. You have my phone, my phone number and my email. You can call me anytime and shoot me an email uh, whenever you, uh, you require. So uh, if, if you have any, any questions, uh, please, uh, I can answer them right away. Okay, I don't see any questions coming in the, the question box. Uh, something else I would like to mention is that uh, biotic earth is not a pH regulator. 
uh, it might re- it, it end, ends up regulating the pH in the soil, but that takes many years with the uh, nutrient cycling and all the vegetation developing. So you really need to check uh, the pH in the soil, mainly because of the seed specification. If it's too acid or too alkaline, uh, nutrients won't be uh, available for the plants. So you might have the NPK in the ground, but uh, you need to go between 5.5 and uh, not above 8. That that would be my recommendation. Oh, I have here. Uh, okay. Have you noticed any specific species that respond better to the treatment or any species that respond poor, poorly? That's a good question, Andrew. Uh, this product has, uh, let me say it differently, sorry. Uh, there are different uh, mycorrhiza species. There is endomycorrhiza and ectomycorrhiza. Ectomycorrhiza is uh, mainly the one uh, uh, that uh, uh, relates with woody plants, with pines and spruce, fir, uh, those kinds of, of trees. And endomycorrhiza, which is in the product, we have a mix around uh, five to seven uh, species of mycorrhiza. The endomycorrhiza work with uh, uh, grasses, uh, some plants, uh, ornamental plants, also some fruit trees we have we have found in in, in the scientific literature. And uh, this kind of mycorrhiza, uh, the species that uh, are included in the product. Uh, were selected so they ca- they have a, a, a wide uh, uh, a widespread uh, application that plants can use and it works with a lot of, uh, of plants. Any other question you guys might have? Okay, well then, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your valuable time. I hope uh, this has been beneficial for you guys. And again, I'm uh, available for any help, any any assistance uh, you might have uh, in the upcoming weeks or, or any projects that uh, you are working on. Please do reach out if you have any, any, any questions. And uh, I'm going to be sending a PDH, uh, our professional hour certificates, to all of the uh, participants. And uh, also, I'm going to share the presentation with all of you so you can have it available and you can check it out. Thank you very much and have a great day. Thanks so much, Renee. Okay, you're welcome.